Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this workshop. This morning's workshop is called Geography Reference, How to Respond to Patron Questions about Vermont Geography. So my name is Joy Worland, and I'm the consultant for continuing education in small and rural libraries at the Vermont Department of Libraries. And I organize a lot of these workshops. So we're excited this morning to welcome Tim Turway. He's from the Vermont Center for Geographic Information, and he's going to share some information and resources about how librarians can help connect patrons to information about Vermont geography. So um, go ahead and start anytime you're ready, Tim. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you, Joy, and good morning, all. Um, again, my name is Tim. Um, we work with a group called VCGI for short. And I'm going to make sure uh, that my screen share is on. Joy, can you confirm you seeing my screen? Yes, I can see it. All right, very good. So I'm going to also turn off my monitor currently and um, save some bandwidth while we're doing this, but I will <clears throat> definitely have some time at the end uh, for questions and answers and, and open conversation, hopefully. So um, save your comments and questions for afterwards and Apologies in advance as I'm going to hopefully blitz through a lot of content in a relatively short time. So let's get started. So right off the bat, Vermont's GIS resources. Um, my intent today is to share with you all what is available, how, and for some, some example uses that you might be asked uh, in your position as librarians. Um, if ever needed uh, to follow up on any of the content that's presented here today, my email is just my name, Tim period Terroy at Vermont.gov, and you can also find a lot of what uh, is going to be referred to uh, today from our website at vcgi.vermont.gov. Okay, so high level overview. We'll start from the basics. What does VCGI do? Uh, we are a state agency currently, uh, although have a history of in and weaving in and out of the state of Vermont government system. Uh, we're previously a nonprofit for some period of time, but now I've been back in state government since 2015. And our tasks are essentially uh, threefold. First is to really maintain and build uh, foundational data sets, of which some of the common ones are the statewide LIDAR program. We'll talk in more detail about all these later on. Parcel program, ortho imagery, and many other ones. Um, we also lead the development of what's called uh, statewide GIS system or geographic information system. Uh, and most importantly, the coordination that it requires. Long story short, GIS uh, being a complicated endeavor, uh, spatial information of where things are in the map and what they relate to. If you don't coordinate uh, in GIS world, things simply do not work or do not work as well as they could if you do. So we lead that effort across all the GIS producing and maintaining uh, public entities throughout the state. And lastly, uh, through efforts like the one we're, we're talking today, we aim to at least enable, uh, if not empower, uh, access to information and uh, understand some of the opportunities for visualization and, and its use. So we'll start right at the basics. What is VT's GIS? And more importantly, where uh, where does it come from? What's available? And who are the parties that contribute to it? Um, the second half of this talk is going to focus a bit on the kinds of information that are available, uh, some example uses that they're applied for, differences in the kinds of products that we publish and maintain, uh, and uh, importantly, some of the common questions both that we see and I presume that you might see in your roles as librarians. And then lastly, uh, a good chunk of this is going to be devoted to examples of how to access different kinds of information, mostly focused on what we call uh, applications that do one or two things uh, in focus, as that's where the majority of uh, introductory uh, questions and users uh, are best served. And then we'll end with some uh, examples of raw data usage <clears throat> and where to find all of the resources that I have shared today. So don't fret, there's going to be a lot of images and a lot of different uh, websites linked in here. We will share this afterwards. Each one of them is hyperlinked for further use. Um, but right off the top, what is GIS, right? So you see a map at the top, there's real tiny little thought bubbles that are questions uh, placed over a map image. And they range from things like, you know, in what town is this point or what permits apply here? Uh, what, how steep are these slopes? How well is solar suited for this location? 
These are kinds of questions that GIS helps us understand by combining spatial data with its location that really allows us to under, understand uh, both spatial and temporal patterns across the Vermont landscape. And it's really comprised of layers upon layers of information. And when you combine these layers, it allows you to ask questions and hopefully answer questions of increasing complexity. All of this, as I mentioned earlier, only works because of the collaboration and the different parties and partners who contribute and maintain data uh, in the state of Vermont. That means basically every agency and then sub department within has some relationship to spatial data or GIS data, although they vary in their level of staffing and support, or let's just say the, the amount and the quality that they provide. Some agencies, for example, Agency of Natural Resources or Agency of Transportation are large GIS players. They publish a lot of information um, and others are comparatively smaller, but nonetheless provide useful information like Agency of Commerce and Community Development or Education, so on and so forth. Other parties who contribute and use GIS are quasi-governmental institutions such as the Regional Planning Commissions that are essentially by proxy county governments in Vermont in lieu of actual having county government, um, as well as other private and academic entity entities also contribute and use uh, GIS resources. And really, you know, how it's used is to answer any combination of questions, mostly about public distribution and equitable distribution of resources to understanding simply what's out there in the evolving Vermont landscape. The important point to note is that the data maintenance and production in Vermont is what we call a federated model uh, among different agencies and providers that each one of them is responsible for maintaining their own respective content. So even though I am a uh, an employee of VCGI and our role is sort of the umbrella uh, party that oversees all of these groups, we are not the sole people providing all of the content that I'm going to share with you today. It's sort of very uh, much done in a Vermont way of being distributed and maintenance and responsibility. So let's start at the simple question, perhaps that we get often from legislature. Let the legislature is, and that is, it's 2022. Aren't you, you know, done mapping yet? Hasn't this all been figured out? And the answer is um, perhaps not so obviously no, because uh, change uh, across a number of items is constantly occurring. Uh, for example, here on the left side, you're seeing um, perhaps you've seen these in storefronts, if at least if you live in Montpelier, these are always in the in the card shop downtown. These are analog release where there's, you know, a physical map you can touch and feel that's um, uh, quite a nice thing to hang on one's wall. What VCGI and our partners do instead of producing analog information directly is rather maintain the digital data that can be used primarily digitally or for analog purposes uh, down the line. So you're on the right hand side, you see an equivalent digital relief of the state of Vermont's landscape. We maintain that kind of information. Uh, again, all things nowadays are digital for multiple uses downstream. So one of the reasons why we're not ever completed mapping uh, the state is because things change in space, right? So we all know that across different scales and human activity, the information that's relevant to a task at hand differs, right? If you're looking at the statewide scale, such as up at the top left corner, there are different things that matter sitting Vermont in a you know, New England regional context versus all the way in the bottom right and everywhere in between, you know, what kinds of things that you're looking at um, are mapped differently or let's say relevant or not relevant. So everywhere across uh, the scale of one's interest do things change in what is uh, worth mapping and worth querying versus what's not. And it's a constant struggle or challenge, let's say, keeps it interesting to try and figure out what works at what scale. Things are also always changing with time, right? So a perfect example of this is environmental change. And here's an example from a few years back. Uh, in near Waterbury, where there was a rather large uh, landslide in the cut what's called the Cotton Brook area. And for example, the image on the left shows uh, an overview of comparing our 2014, what's called our bare earth LIDAR data uh, 
with a 2021 take after the landslide. And you can see in the green, the yellow areas where the actual landslide occurred versus the little bubble above it in 2014. You know, so the environment is always changing, as we well know, and it's yet another reason why um, the data that we maintain is it too trying to keep up with that change and be as current and both historically um, useful as possible. Our efforts are constantly changing with technology. As I mentioned, most of what we do is all digital oriented. You know, if you go back to the early 80s to the origins of Vermont GIS, uh, you see a document here, the creation of the Vermont State Database. You know, there was a, uh, quite some vision at the time for looking at how all of these different layers that contribute to a GIS uh, would be needed to be both created and maintained throughout time. And that too has changed with the technology and capacity to do so, right? So even, you know, 10 years later, early 90s, most of what we were doing was serving data via mail uh, through floppy disks that totaled in 17 megabytes of data at the time, which is paltry by today's comparison, but it just gives a flavor of how what we do as geographers and GIS professionals co-evolves with the technology available at the time. And to where today we're serving not megabytes, but over terabytes of data uh, that's all basically served via servers, you know, that give information over internet connections, right? So people primarily are ask, accessing our information through applications, as I mentioned before. Um, you can also download data over internet connection. But one way I'd like to uh, characterize what we present is something like Netflix or Maps, and that you you no longer go to the video store to rent the map or the video, right? In this question, you don't go to the geographic office to to find the big paper print of the map, but rather you access it online through things that are called streaming services that drive applications that are focused on one or many uh, different kinds of information. So all of this allows us to both present uh, tools that are, again, internet accessible and they aggregate across jurisdictions. So data that we provide is ultimately uh, sourced from multiple parties, from municipalities themselves, from regional planning commissions to differing state agencies, as I was referring to before. We are an aggregator and we do that through tools what's, such as the Vermont Open Geodata Portal that I will refer to later. And then we too send that up to the federal level um, through what is called uh, data.gov. So there's a cross geographic lineage of all of these tools and technology that links it all up. Uh, in a very modern way. And the last thing that really changes, you know, uh, are with geography and, and the resources we make available are people's preferences, norms, and needs. Uh, here's a kind of obvious example of that in which you're looking at two formerly differently named towns in Vermont. The town of Jay used to be Carthage and the town of uh, Sutton used to be Billy Mead, just an example that we no longer call those Carthage and Billy Mead. And so there are perfect examples of how things like geographic names evolve and change over time, which requires constant maintenance on our behalf. And so what you get really is a dynamic result of resources that are available. Uh, it's constant evolving digital representations of geographic information throughout Vermont. And we're quite pleased to report essentially from 2020 onward, uh, it's possible to construct what we might consider a virtual Vermont for, for reference, right? No floppy disk needed. You can combine multiple things that we have available, whether they're topography or hydrography, ortho imagery, and really get a, a fairly current and detailed picture of you know, a virtual representation of the state of Vermont. You're looking at the right-hand side there of the confluence the Winooski uh, River in downtown Montpelier. And on the left, you see an animation of different layers being stacked over and on top of each other. It's really fascinating that we, you know, fairly close to real time, can show how Vermont looks virtually from the comfort of your internet connection. So on to the second stage, let's talk about the, some example kinds of data that are available and some of the uses that they might serve, some of the questions that they might serve. Um, it's kind of passe by now, um, but one of the longest, if not the longest standing uh, resources available is what it's what's called the statewide ortho imagery program. So these are 
aerial photographs of the entire state of Vermont taken at different times um, in different ways uh, that are the, one of the bedrock underlying layers of all mapped information. You might be familiar with looking at tools like Google Maps to navigate yourself around, you know, traveling directions. We provide what since 1994 digital leaf off ortho imagery statewide. So leaf off meaning you can see in the right hand side, it's taken at a time of year in a very short window in the spring where the trees have yet to show their leaves so you can see what's underneath them. Uh, and we provide that at a couple different resolutions uh, and a couple different flavors, such as color, color for red and black and white, all of which have different use cases. Again, this is like so obvious now in 2022, but nonetheless, it's worth reporting that it's a foundational thing that we still maintain on a yearly basis. Um, and I say digital since 1994 because, um, as you probably some of you are aware, uh, analog historical aerial imagery was available was available before that time. However, is not largely not digitized. And since 1994, uh, the coverage or the locations in which where every year portions of Vermont have been flown has changed. So you can see examples. We have these on our website showing, you know, on a yearly basis, which locations uh, were covered by our ortho imagery so that you can now look at change over time, at least since the 90s, quite easily uh, in particular locations. And currently where we're going is trying to get the whole state in one fell swoop. So in the top right, you see an image this past year, 2021, we had planned to get the entire state in one flight program. However, the weather did not uh, cooperate for allow us to do so. So we only got a chunk of it. And so this year we're out hopefully capturing the rest of it. Nonetheless, uh, all of these resources are available uh, by year and they are date stamped so it's clear as to what when something was flown and taken wherever you're looking at. Another uh, high use and, and increasingly um, important data set that we provide is the statewide LIDAR program or what's uh, more specifically is high resolution surface of the earth data. Uh, what that is, is also uh, done from fixed wing uh, airplanes. Basically, it's shooting lasers at the earth. Uh, we get uh, elevation points in return, and then we make useful derived products from them. Um, you get something, this all begins with what's called a point cloud, and you can see kind of an outline in that right-hand image there of what looks like a covered bridge. That is a covered bridge in Waitsfield in particular. Uh, and those, as you can see, are three-dimensional representations of the surface of the earth, including, you know, vegetation and structures at a certain density of points that we take, you know, that is captured by these sensors uh, from planes. And we currently have what's called QL2 uh, LIDAR, quality level two data available. That's equivalent roughly of one foot contour accuracy throughout the state. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is an incredible resource that we can develop uh, different resources from. Uh, it begins again with the point cloud. You can see this is the Vermont State House being cut through as a, a section view to see what actually is represented uh, in the return data that you get from the flights. And those kinds of point cloud returns are turned into useful products, right? This is how this all begins. Uh, and it's turned into things called digital surface models or digital elevation models or normal normalized digital surface models plus other products like contours and aspect of slope and hill shade that are more directly useful for your common um, or any person looking for this kind of information. So we make these kinds of products from LIDAR data. And it ultimately results in that given any one location in, in Vermont, we have many products that are derived from it that can answer any number of questions, right? So again, from steepness of slope to contours to um, just looking at the bare earth as if you could pull all the buildings and trees away. And this, this is often done in times in relation with other GIS layers like the ortho imagery I had previously mentioned. Uh, statewide coverage, again, done at different times. So we have applications that show you can figure out where things were most recently flown. We're currently in the process of renewing or updating all this information statewide. Um, again, we have information available on the, on the accuracy of this information uh, relative to past products. Again, it's highly evolving. Uh, you can see uh, even in the past 10, 12 years how things have evolved in quality. 
and derivative products, for example, looking at the what we call the normalized digital surface model that shows you things like the height of trees and the height of buildings are super useful, as you can imagine, the folks interested in forestry or understand, uh, interested in urbanism, trying to understand how tall is that object? Well, we have data that can help answer those kinds of questions. There are many, many types of users and uses that come out of this um, from simple to complex, and these are just some examples of uses that are based on uh, this information. Archaeology, wetlands, assessing solar exposure for energy, uh, renewable energy development to understanding visibility and site suitability, just some of the common large scale ones that uh, are done with Vermont data. Switching gears a bit, another perhaps the most common data set that we offer statewide is data through what is called our parcel program. This is statewide annual grand list joint property parcel data. So what it is is it takes the municipal official grand lists that every town submits to the tax department every year, and it joins that grand list with the latest available digital parcel data that we also get from towns uh, on a rolling basis. And then it rolls it up into one uniform data set statewide. And we publish this through in a variety of ways. And what this means is that you know, even as recently as 2017, where we only had a slightly over half of all parcels in the state being able to match with the statewide grand list, we now have uh, close to 100% match of uh, parcels with the grand list information via something, a magic little unique identifier called the SPAN or the school property account number. This is the, the tool that allows these data to connect. Um, and what this does is it allows users to use tools such as that we publish, like the Vermont Parcel Viewer, which is an extremely popular, uh, simple uh, application that we uh, stand up and maintain that allows people to basically zoom around anywhere, anywhere in Vermont, see the latest, greatest uh, parcel data for an area of interest, and then you know make a selection, see that respective parcels data in in a table and then potentially you know download it as a table for use elsewhere so you can see here the the grand list fields of the selected parcel here in this example picture are uh, at the bottom of the screen incredibly useful for many things uh, because parcel data that we steward are uniform and joined with the grand list that means that anything in the grand list itself is representable on a map so you see an example table of the grand list on the left there. It now has about 41 different fields, one of which is a land use code. Um, so this map is an example of the different land use codes associated with the grand list that are, again, visualizable because they persist in the parcel data. So again, that grand list is an incredibly powerful tool in its own right. And when you spatialize it with parcel data, uh, you can use it in many different ways to understand patterns across the Vermont landscape. Another interesting component of the grand list itself, uh, as published by the tax department, is something called resident ownership code. Uh, resident ownership code means uh, it has a couple different values to it. For example, uh, towns collect and process data on whether someone is uh, an owner within a town, they are out of town, but still in Vermont. They are an out of state owner or they are a corporation. So one using tools such as our interactive map viewer that we'll talk about later can query the parcel layer for the resident ownership code status on a parcel by parcel basis in a town, for example. This is the town of Stowe queried for the resident ownership code for NS, which means out of state ownership. Uh, and perhaps unsurprisingly, you see quite a bit results of parcels within the town of Stowe that are registered as out-of-state owners, so 14, uh, 1,413 parcels in particular. So again, lots can be done with parcel data simply by the power of it being joined with that uniform grant list. You can also do things like uh, more commonplace spatial task. This is an animation of using parcel data to get measurements uh, both in perimeter and of acreage of a property in question. So you can see here the parcels are being used to snap the drawing tool uh, and that the, the uh, real-time 
perimeter and acreage once you complete a polygon as they're available on the screen. So again, these are the kinds of uses that parcel data uh, supports. Uh, <clears throat> it's also if you're uh, mobile ready, if you're of the good fortune to be somewhere in Vermont with a relatively reliable cell phone data connection, you can view parcel data relative to your location via GPS out in the field. For example, you wanted to be out, you know, understanding, you know, where you uh, are or someone's uh, uh, rough estimate of property parcel lines are. You see that little blue dot denotes one's location. And you can see that uh, again uh, through cell, cell phone uh, data access availability. Again, it's not, of course, uh, comprehensive in Vermont without perfect coverage, but nonetheless, it works for when you have cell uh, data connection. Parcels are also used by other agencies for many different things. Uh, for example, the tax department themselves in support of renters. Um, we stood up a little tool called the Span Finder that uh, renters often have a hard time uh, filling out uh, paperwork for, but they need it for certain applications. So there is an address or find a Span tool by entering your address, and it gives you the return of the span of renter properties um, throughout the state. Again, this wouldn't be possible unless this was uh, coordinated and aggregated across municipalities and state entities uh, to do so. We also support an evolving uh, approach to the underlying data and that being uh, land surveys uh, that underlie parcels. I should emphasize that parcel data are not and never will be the equivalent of legal um, uh, land surveys, but they continuously can learn from land survey documentation as available. We steward what's called the Vermont Land Survey Library that now as of 2020 um, onward is a place for licensed land surveyors to contribute uh, digital copies in PDF format of surveys as they are completed. So here's an example. A licensed surveyor comes on here and draws the index location of where the survey in question is located on the map, and a user can click on that, that index polygon and get right from the pop-up the PDF of the survey in question as exemplified by this one here on the screen uh, in Killington and Stockbridge. So it's a really easy way of accessing uh, the underlying data that ultimately does live in the town uh, records, land records that is. So evolving ways to access really important information are now available. Other things that are available, other GIS data uh, moving on from parcels are things devoted, for example, to flooding resources. These are some images from Irene. She's now over 10 years ago now. Uh, clearly still an ongoing concern and rightfully so in the state of Vermont. And the GIS resources have so too evolved with planning for flooding, right? We live in a fairly uh, water available state. So for example, here in uh, northern Vermont between Montgomery and Montgomery Center. Uh, folks are typically uh, associated or understanding of what are called uh, digital firms or D firms that are made available by FEMA at the federal level. And these are not 100% coverage throughout the state of Vermont, but they're about two thirds or so covering in Vermont. And they're currently being updated, but nonetheless, they do exist. We make them available. There are tools devoted specifically to helping homeowners and other interested parties at trying to understand, you know, where the flood insurance rate maps are for uh, those locations that are available. So here's an example of what those look like. However, as time passes and resources uh, uh, are available, more detailed maps are uh, coming in and looking at greater in, uh, level of detail of exposure, right, or risk levels. This is a recent example in 2022, just made available a few months ago by our colleagues at UVM who took a the high resolution LIDAR data and developed a model for the entire Lake Champlain Basin to understand the relative risk exposure um, across different classes, right, to two year through 500 year flood exposures uh, and classified that on a map. And these are again are not regulatory like D firms, but nonetheless, they are uh, informational assets that are now available uh, online in a relatively easy way. And when we have big data releases like this, we typically post them 
uh, on our news page of vcgi.vermont.gov, such as this example here, and that links all that, you know, the commonly asked questions and details associated with the product at hand. So this is just another example of where to go and find and learn about something as we make it available. As I mentioned before, there are websites and tools that are out there specifically devoted to help people find and understand the relative flood exposure. Uh, on the left hand side is the Vermont Natural Resources Atlas, toggling on layers for uh, pre-canned uh, the FEMA DFIRM layers, or on the right hand side is a screenshot from the specifically devoted what's called the Flood Ready Atlas that is also overseen by the Agency of Natural Resources. And it's just a map application solely devoted to uh, trying to share the latest grace available flood information throughout Vermont. Switching gears, um, we at VCGI also steward and make available administrative boundaries of different kinds, whether that is uh, taking the decennial census data uh, that becomes available every 10 years, uh, as well as the interim ACS data and publishing that in a Vermont specific way, such as the map on the left is showing the results of population change between 2010 and 2020 decennial censuses uh, that we published and made available about a year ago. Um, and we also have with our partners available historical population data throughout Vermont. Uh, those are both charts uh, and data examples of how Vermont's population has changed by town and county over time. We have that available as um, tabular data um, that I will share links with uh, in the future here. Slides, here we go. Looking at the historical census uh, across town by towns from 1791 to 2020. This is just an example of, you know, data key to the administrative unit of the town or the Vermont municipality that, you know, perhaps would have been really hard to research or find out at one point, but they are now readily and easily available. Um, so just a great example of administrative boundaries um, and the resources along those lines. Uh, in a similar vein, we also process the uh, decennially updated legislative districts for state government. So this is the most recent incarnation of Vermont House and Senate districts of where they're located respectively throughout um, uh, in respect to towns themselves. As you can see, you know, House House boundaries are uh, increasingly com complicated. They go through their own redistricting process. We don't run that. That's run by Secretary of State, but we uh, ultimately make the products available in GIS format compliant with other um, uh, GIS data layers such that people can make maps out of them. We also stored some simple tools like this one, Vermont Boundaries and Jurisdictions, that allows users to simply look at things like the most recent House and Senate districts overlaid with town boundaries. And you can see quirky things such as the difference where the newly uh, christened city of Essex Junction does not line up with its most recent uh, house district. Surprise, surprise. But nonetheless, uh, mapping can be complicated, but folks can see these kinds of things in a relatively easy way uh, with some of the applications that we make available for them. As I mentioned earlier, uh, not everything presented here is done by us at VCGI, but rather by our partners elsewhere in state government. Um, this is a great example of something done by the Public Service Department, which is in charged in part with mapping broadband access by each individual address unit throughout the state. So what you're looking at here is a map of address points, official Vermont address points by how well served they are by broadband access. So those green points on the map reflect the best, which is 100 by 100 uh, megabytes per second service, blue or 25.3, white dots are 4.1 and red addresses lack even 4.1 access as of 2021. So they make available tools in raw data format, as well as web applications that display this data on an address level of what the best known uh, broadband access is across the entire state. Uh, again, a perfect example of GIS being used in, uh, to a really currently important issue um, and relatively easy to access through some of these web mapping tools uh, that the Public Service Department has made available. 
Another really common request that we uh, receive is understanding what digital or digitized historical imagery are available. The answer is unfortunately not as nearly as much as we would like. It varies by location, but some of what we do have available currently is still highly interesting and useful. Perhaps the best case of that is what's called the 1962 H&L sets for high and low, respectively. Um, at the top image, you're looking at Rutland in 1962, the H level, and then at the L or more zoomed in higher resolution L level, the same location, you can see what's available in that 1962 set. But it's really great for trying to go back in time and say, hey, you know, 50 some years ago, what do we understand uh, this to look like relative to current best available imagery? So um, as you can imagine, we have great interest in trying to make this more available over time. Here's an example again, again of that 1962 data set on the left hand side uh, on the top set again in Rutland, looking at 1962 relative to 2016 in the same exact location. And in the bottom two images, 20, or 1962 on the left-hand side and 2016 on the right-hand side for Williston. So Williston in particular is interesting because you can see in 62, the interstate or I-89 is just being built. It's still kind of dirt and under construction. Where in 2016, you, th you see things like Home Depot and Walmart and all of that development that has since proceeded in that same location. <clears throat> Different resources similar thinking that are available currently are what's called high resolution land cover um, this is a combination of ortho imagery and, and high res lidar derived product that classifies the surface of vermont into uh, different categories from tree canopy to soil water buildings roads etc you know this is helps us greatly for understanding statewide prevalence of things like impervious surface or tree canopy coverage and it was done in partnership with our partners at University of Vermont uh, UVM who've made this basically the best available in the nation uh, high resolution land cover data set. So in the bigger image you see this is the lake land cover in Bennington. Uh, the buildings are in red and the trees are in various colors of green. It even makes distinctions between deciduous forest, which is the lighter tree canopy color to evergreen or coniferous forest, which is the darker green. Um, and in the top right, you see an example of uh, the land cover in downtown St. Albans. Um, just get an understanding of what it looks like in a more close up urban environment. And again, we make this data available in a variety of ways in raw data, such as uh, the example land cover page here shown at the Vermont Open Geodata portal, where users can either download or stream uh, web services of this content, or they can look at it in tools already in web map tools, such as the ANR Natural Resources Atlas uh, on the right hand image, looking at it in reference to other layers like the parcel layer there to understand how the two spatial data sets relate. So again, same data, it's served in multiple ways across different government entities. So hopefully it suffices the needs or the types of users and use cases that they are in need of. Last section, uh, talking about how to access. So what are some common applications that folks use that are, you know, all this great data is available. OK, how do I find it? And then uh, we'll focus most of our time there and then I'll end up with some examples of the raw data as exemplified or available at the Open Geodata portal and then leave you with some resources of where to find yet more information uh, once you're done. So the types of applications that we make available are a couple there's a couple different types. So the first different first kind is something that we would call a theme or a task specific application. Uh, for example, uh, I'll show a couple in a moment here, like what's my elevation or beneath the trees. Theme or task applications are generally the simplest. They're devoted basically to one kind of inquiry, like what's my elevation or what's beneath the trees? And they do one thing very well. They don't do anything beyond that. Um, in contrast, viewer type applications such as the interactive map viewer and the ANR Atlas are fully fledged viewers. They've got lots of different layers inside them. They're, they're what we call kitchen sink type applications. 
Um, they allow you to look at multiple preloaded data set in reference or in relation to one another. So they are better for trying to understand, you know, more complex problems. But then again, they are still viewers. They're not full fledged GIS solutions. So we're going to focus on example applications of this theme or task specific kind and viewer types today. There's also two other kinds. There are basically finders that allow you to find data like the ortho finder or the LIDAR finder. And then there's full fledged, you know, GIS desktop applications, which we will not cover today. They're more advanced user focused, such as QGIS or ArcGIS, uh, which is where more advanced GIS functionality occurs. So beneath the trees is a perfect example here of a task specific or theme specific application. You're looking at two layers, the ortho imagery layer in downtown Montpelier, and then the underlying bare earth LIDAR hillshade. And all it is is this little viewport window that you can drag around and see essentially what's underneath the ortho photograph. So you can see the shape of the toe of the slope there. Um, you can see some of the surface tinting done in processing. You see there the stairs of the state house step the roadways as they're impressed on the topography. So it's a really cool tool just to give you a, a flavor of quickly looking at what GIS data can do. Um, but again, it's a simple, simple tool that kind of um, is neat for first time users of GIS. Uh, and again, this is available statewide. The Vermont parcel viewer that I mentioned earlier is also one of our extremely high use applications that allows you again to view that grand list join parcel data statewide. And in this example here, you can select parcels and then choose to export their tabular data, their, their grand list data straight to a spreadsheet platform like Excel. So it makes it really easy to see you know, tabular data that you might have interest in for other purposes right from the map interface. And again, we provide this for all towns throughout the state of Vermont. This is the Vermont Parcel Viewer. Uh, other agencies have made use of our elevation or LIDAR data, such as A&R here. They made a tool called What's My Elevation? And this animation shows you could basically pick any point throughout the state of Vermont. And I'm clicking on points there across the map. And up on the right hand side, the little information box associated with it changes in real time depending on where you're clicking on the map, the elevation both of the surface of the earth as well as the top of the trees or the structures as derived from the LIDAR data. So just super cool, simple use. You know, what's my elevation? Just click a point in the map and get both the bare earth as well as sort of a good estimate of how tall that tree was at the time that the LIDAR data was made available. So another very focused theme application um, utilizing latest greatest LIDAR data. There's other more regulatory focused applications that fit the theme app bill. This is what's called the permit navigator. Again, this uses statewide grand list uh, parcel data to query uh, the ownership and intersect that with known boundaries of things like Act 250 verification. So this is a really quick animation, but it's showing that I've entered a address currently and I want to know I want to add a deck to my property. So is there any relative permits that apply? So I hit enter and it goes through Act 250. It goes open burning. It's querying about the details of my project. And once I answer all the questions, it gives me back a quick answer. Permit navigator results yes or no or with what qualifications to may a permit apply that you can then follow up with your respective ANR staff person to understand you know, the details of that permit. So again, only available because we have GIS data available um, of a certain quality statewide. We link all of these kinds of resources um, from our VCGI organizational website, vcgi.vermont.gov. There, there's a particular page called vcgi.vermont.gov slash maps. This is where you'll find examples of these kitchen sink viewer applications like the interactive map viewer or the atlas that I was mentioned previously. So this is where you will go to find uh, which ones are available. And I want to give right now just an overview, some of the kind of the functionality that's available inside something like the interactive map viewer. Um, you can see on the left hand side, you have preloaded GIS later layers like base maps and different operational layers, but you can also toggle off and on different kinds of layers like the LIDAR uh, example here. 
um, the digital surface model I was talking about, change the transparency of those layers with the little sliders as they're available on the per you know per item basis to make them transparent to see things underneath. You can turn on then layers on top of them, like the land cover that I mentioned. Turn on parcels, and boom, you've got effectively you know a base map for throughout the state that's showing you know the elevation and the land cover and the parcels uh, everywhere in the state um, through the tool. And we like to joke, you know, great, I can toggle layers on and off. Is that it? Um, no, it, it's you can do a lot more with things like the interactive map viewer if you do what's called create a public account. Long story short, that allows you to save projects in your browser such that you can return to them for future reference. Uh, meaning here's an example on the left hand side of you know things that were created in the interactive viewer map viewer for future reference, like tree maps or looking at stormwater maps. You can open up them up in a later uh, browser session. And you can do things like this. This is um, an example of digitizing features that one might see out in the Vermont landscape. In this case, the uh, Little River area uh, near Waterbury, near the Waterbury Reservoir. Um, you can see in the LIDAR, the Barrier Hill shade remnants of what like things like stone walls and different foundation pits. Um, and you can begin to digitize them, meaning you can draw lines that reflect them that are exportable for other uses or you can get the relative coordinates of those locations on the map that you can see there. You can export printable PDFs uh, through things like the interactive map viewer. You can take a screenshot or you can export shape files from those locations or you can you know, create a map in your browser and then share it with someone by email exactly as it would appear on your screen. So if you hit that share button, click the email button there after you've got your map set up, and it will open exactly uh, as you've drawn it on whoever you're sending it to's desktop as well. Really handy tool. And the interactive map viewer is merely one of multiple viewer kitchen sink type applications available, although each one has a different focus. For example, the uh, enhanced 99 or 911 board is focused on emergency service rendering, you know, getting fire access to where it needs to go in the event of emergency. So here, you can see their viewer looks slightly similar. It's got you know similar widgets and tools linked everywhere, albeit it by default has different layers loaded. So you can click on an address point here, for example, and get a link to the Google Street View, and it's got all the official addresses by default toggled on. Whereas uh, the planning atlas, again, different focus, it's on development or urban development. So it's got things like downtown district boundaries and buffers and growth center boundaries. Again, it's just trying to cue your attention into the different reasons why you might be using that viewer tool. And again, lastly, the ANR atlas, which is natural resources focus, such as this example of mapping uh, both soils and wetlands across the state for understanding you know, their prevalence. So perhaps the best documented of all these viewer applications is the ANR Atlas. There's a wonderful document actually pulled together by partners up at UVM through the Sea Grant of how to use the ANR Natural Resources Atlas that I've linked here as a PDF. You know everything from the basic functions, the quick tools and toolbar functions are listed here. But I want to add to this that this does not just apply to the ANR Atlas. It really applies to those other tools like the interactive map viewer or the planning atlas, etc., because they are all built on the same platform using the same data underneath. They're just presented differently. So they are still the same technological tool that you know it's the same way to draw or identify a feature uh, across all of them so it applies in multiple ways now a quick caveat with all of these viewers um, they are indeed viewers they're not full-fledged gis solutions they're not a you know a true digitization platforms or cart cartographic platforms or data analysis platforms they're really for understanding you know basic viewing tasks they're, you know, the kitchen sink tools. They've got preloaded layers that has uh, benefits and detractors. And because the layers are mostly preloaded, if you want to answer more advanced type questions like, you know, distribution of resources, that lends itself to more skillful use of things like desktop GIS. So they are limited in their purpose, um, but they are suited for basic, you know, just come in the door type questions. They're freely available with internet access. People can use them for trial and error and they won't break anything in so doing. So they're really ripe for exploring. We also list 
beyond the kitchen sink viewer type apps, all kinds of theme and or uh, task specific apps that our other partner agencies maintain at this page here um, that links, you know, who the agency or department is, what the interactive map tool is and its relative uses. So you see things like the tick tracker that Department of Health stands up on uh, crowdsourced tick sightings throughout the state. Uh, or things like community profiles or public health reporting tools to tourism maps, all kinds of maps here that different agencies or departments. I think there's over 30 of them that we keep track that are available here, depending on the kinds of uses that a person might have interest in. So just click on the link and you'll get a link to those specific tools. We also link to historical map resources that are housed elsewhere, whether that is through State Archives and Records Administration or uh, different academic institutions throughout the state um, to federal institutions like USGS to larger um, uh, libraries like the public library systems in New York or Library of Congress. These links are tailored specifically to where one can find their freely available historic map resources uh, to further their their interests. So again, we evolve these as we find them um, in reference to Vermont type information over time. We also maintain at least to VCGI's maintain products, a, a fairly extensive list of FAQs, things that are devoted to general mapping type questions or using GIS data in general to specific to programs like how do I know what the details of parcel data are or imagery or LIDAR program. Each one of these has a number of FAQ answers that are you know devoted to the most common things that we're asked over the years. So they evolve in time and are a very good resource for folks as well. And then lastly, um, if folks want to take it upon themselves to get go further with their GIS self-directed education, we list both concepts and training and support resources here. Everything from you know common terms and practices, the type of software and tools that folks get exposed to, the to common type task tutorials that we encounter. Uh, on a recent, you know, regular basis. Those are all linked from this how to and education resources page at bcgi.vermont.gov. And I'm going to end this whole session here with an example of, you know, one of the more advanced type uses of the open geodata portal accessing a raw data set there. You can think of this as like, you know, the front facing library of all spatial or GIS data throughout the state of Vermont that's, you know, hosted by all of these different providers. Um, a an item page there. It's got over a thousand items. We're just going to look at one of these here. This is a product by A and R. Um, you can see who the publisher is up there at the top. It's a data site set looking at the extent of glacial lakes in the Champlain Sea or its former extent throughout the state. You can see there there are commonly um, item description uh, right near the top. You get the table preview of the, of the items contents. It's details on the right hand side, such as when it was uh, uploaded and if it's intended to be updated ever again or not what frequency. And on the bottom right, some further use links if you wanted to make a map right in your browser with ArcGIS online tools or access the metadata, so on and so forth. So in its example, this is an example of a, a data item page at the raw data serving open geodata portal. And if, a folk, if folks click, for example, I want to create a map in ArcGIS Online, they would see something like the left-hand image where you can preview the content and spatial extent of these uh, glacial lakes in the Champlain Sea here on the left. And uh, I'll sort of walk through here just how cool it is to have this kind of thing available given our colleagues at the Geological Survey and ANR. Um, to see this kind of thing that go back not only you know decades but literally centuries here to see the extent of these in relation to present day information. So here is a place uh, snippet of Chittenden County with some present day landmarks identified by the circles in this data set. You know, combined with our lidar data that helped create it, allows one to sort of peel back the layers and look at the extent everywhere from. Lower Fort Anne to Upper Fort Anne period to Lake Coville 
and really look at them basically understanding, oh, all of Burlington was underwater 13,000 years ago, or some place even more hard to understand, like the Bolton Valley Access Road way up high was also underwater at the greatest extent. This is an example of the power of raw GIS data, you know, presented through the Open Geodata Portal and using it for a variety of questions and then, you know, creating animations, understand the extent here of Williston, just how much of what we take for granted today was formerly under glaciers. So again, I'm going to leave uh, this PDF document with you all. It's got tons of linked resources within. These are some of the more common ones that I've mentioned here. Uh, and please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, or myself uh, moving forward if you've got questions, you know, uh, coming up. And we're just happy to make ourselves known of what we are and what we do and uh, hopefully can help you all as librarians in the future. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Tim, for offering this. That was a lot of information um, and good to know where um, librarians can send their patrons when they have questions. We do have a few more minutes in this session today. So if anyone wants to ask him questions while we have him here, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or type something in the chat. Hello. Um, morning. Morning. Um, I just had a question about if people wanted to create a public account. I was a little um, confused about what they can do with that. I understand they could save a project they're working on, on the research, but um, yep. hoping you could elaborate a little more on that, please. Yeah, a public account is essentially uh, a tool because it's allows you to use any of those viewer applications in your web browser. If you wanted, you let's say you a person st gets started making a map and it's got layers turned off and on and its spatial extent is established. If you close out your browser session and you don't have a public account created, you lose all of that work. Um, so in lieu of having a desktop program, when if you ever wanted to let's say create a map of um the stormwater point locations in your town and that's the map you've created working you first want to be logged into a public account or have one created and then that would allow you to then save it in a browser session you can come back with your credentials at a future time and and begin where you left off thank you yep yep There was a question in the chat about what we'll be sharing, and I just put some links in there about where they will be shared. So we'll do the recording and also Tim's slides. Yeah, yeah. a note along those lines, um, not just at the end there where they're hyperlinks, but pretty much on, on most slides, if there was an application or a tool or a data set reference, there was a live hyperlink that will be active in the PDF that we share back out. So folks can, um, have a lot of browsing 